Well, the first day of school has finally come and gone, I think, for everyone now, or at least both schools. And after each student has found his classroom and his desk and put everything into the cubby, that's the time most teachers then begin to go over the rules and the procedures of this classroom. And as long as everybody follows the rules, no talking out of turn, no texting, put your phone away, do your own work, turn it in on time, treat everybody with respect. As long as everybody follows the rules, life is good. No detentions, no suspensions. But of course, we all know that the purpose of school isn't to send your kids there so that they learn the rules, right? I mean, that's, schools exist so much more than just learning what to do and not to do. But it's there in all those hours of classroom time that the gifts and the talents are really brought out of each student. As you learn your maths and your geography and, and all of your writing and spelling words and, and even to play an instrument or a sport. All of that schooling exists to, to really bring out the maturity uh, and knowledge and character so that you can be the very best businesswoman, graphic design artist, AC repairman, chemical engineer, teacher, pastor, whatever, all the different professions, schools exist so that you might be equipped to have a really wonderful life. And the rules, they're important, but they are a servant to this much greater good. Well, it was not their first day of school. It was not the first time they'd even heard the rules. But they were about to begin something brand new. After 40 years of wandering, they were now about to go into their promised home country. And like a teacher on the very first day of school, Moses gathered the people together to go over the rules. Now Israel, he said, listen up to all the laws and the decrees that I'm about to teach you so that you may go in and possess the land the Lord your God of your ancestors is giving to you. Now don't add to what I'm telling you. Don't subtract to any of the commands, but keep the commands of the Lord your God that I give you. And for the next 1,500 years, from the time of Moses to the time of Jesus, they did have some moments of great faithfulness to the rules. But most of the time, they didn't. And they faced the consequences of breaking the rules, which were often quite severe. But even as they faced the consequences, everybody agreed that the rules themselves were good. And that they demonstrated a great wisdom to the other peoples and nations of the world whose laws and rules were nothing like theirs. But most importantly, it bared witness to a great and wonderful relationship between God and his people. Moses would say to them, well, what other nation is there that has their gods so near to them the way the Lord our God is near us? And everyone would agree. And then came the big warning. Be careful. Watch yourselves closely. Now you'd think this is the big moment that Moses is going to come down like a ton of bricks. He's the lawgiver, right? He's the one with the stone tablets. He's the one going to make it happen, right, with all the laws. And, and you'd think this would be the time to really, you know, nail down those rules. After all, their report card in the next 1,500 years was a dismal failure of incomplete work, of, of uh, disruptive behavior, uh, of a failure to learn from past mistakes. But it wasn't the rules. It was 
the relationship that Moses made great emphasis. He said to them, Do not forget what your eyes have seen. Do not let them fade from your heart. Teach them to your children and their children after them. It is what they have seen in this relationship with God that would have the greatest impact. For they have seen with their own eyes God in action on their behalf. Every morning when they got up, the Lord provided bread for them. And when they were thirsty, He turned the deserts into pools of water from a rock. Their eyes had seen how their clothes over 40 years did not wear out as they wandered. Their eyes had seen the great protection and the love and the presence of God each night with the pillar of fire that was in their presence and the cloud by day. God was this great good shepherd over them and His love was palpable. You could see it and feel it and taste it. He was good all the time and all the time. God was good. And so Moses, he took out his highlighter. He took out his number two and he, he underlined, he double underlined and circled the love of God. But it would be the rules that the people would want and embrace over the rule giver. You know, and some people like rules and some people don't. Some people keep them, and many don't. And that would really divide the people into two great and obvious distinctions among God's people between the pure, who would keep all of the rules of God, and, and just there would be this great confidence that, of course, God loves us because we do what He says. And the defiled, those who did not keep the rules, and whose lives had become a stinking mess, quite literally. And it would be this way right up until the time of Jesus would come. And that's the reason it was so confusing the way Jesus behaved. Because he didn't always seem to keep the rules. On a Sabbath, he would heal people. The Sabbath rule was pretty basic and simple. Rest. What was that again? Rest. What does it mean? That means no work. Oh, oh okay. But it was even just the basic simple stuff, like common sense stuff that his disciples didn't seem to do. They, they, they didn't wash their hands before they ate. That was a rule back then, you know. And, and, and they questioned Jesus about it. And, and obviously Jesus kind of fell into one of these two groups, right? And, and not the pure, but the defiled. But Jesus would make it very clear about the laws and himself. He would remind everybody that he had not come to abolish the law or the prophets. He had come to fulfill them. Jesus came to do all of the rules and the laws. He is one greater than Moses, not to give, but to do and fulfill them all. Now, of course, that would take some, uh, some clarification exactly what that all meant. And so Jesus did gather the people together and he said, now everybody, listen. It's, it's not what goes into a person, dirt on your hands or food, that defiles a person, but it is what comes out of a person. That's what defiles them. Well, this completely threw everybody for a loop. And his own disciples would question him, well, you're saying then like eating pork's okay. And that's against the rules. And so Jesus had to go back into the classroom. And he had to look his students in the face and remind them that you're not that dull. Let's go back to biology class, right? Okay, work with me now. You eat food. It goes in. goes to your stomach. It goes out. It doesn't go into your character, your heart, who you are as a person, whether good or bad, right? It just, it's just nourishing your body. But it is what comes out of the heart 
That is what defiles you. And Jesus had a, a very long list. But consider a contemporary list of today of, of what he's talking about with a defilement of the heart. You could be one of the best teachers that Kansas has to offer. You could be the classroom that every student wants to be in and every parent hopes their kid gets to be there because you're an excellent teacher. And you could also have within your heart, in that very class, a rather annoyed, almost despising a particular student and that particular student's parents because of the run-in that you had with them. It was so ugly and so nasty, there truly is a very ugly hate in your heart. Well, let's just throw it open to the whole congregation. You, you could come to worship at Ascension to every service that we have to offer. You could learn everything there is to be a good Lutheran. You could know the catechism. You could know everything inside and out and still harbor within your heart a great dissatisfaction with something or someone and a contempt grows. You could be the most honest and meticulous business woman or man and following every law and tax code, every regulation, and yet still have a callousness in the heart against the poor that live among us here in Wichita. You could be the most faithful spouse to your wife and yet still harbor sexual fantasies that you nourish occasionally through images on the internet. Now to the outside world, you would look like a wonderful teacher, a businesswoman or man. You would look like a great churchgoer. You would look like a wonderful spouse. But the heart is defiled. And God sees the heart. And the consequences are severe. And the rules do nothing to help you. They were never intended or designed to purify the heart. They just don't have that power. You need a new heart. Something brand new. A heart that has been brought near to God. A heart that has received His love in full. A heart that has been forgiven every defiling thought and desire and made 100% pure. You need a heart that loves God back with absolutely everything. A heart that loves people and yourself. A heart that just naturally flows with the goodness of God. That's what we need. God knows that's what we need. And that's the reason Moses wasn't the final answer. He was the lawgiver. It is Jesus, the one who fulfills the law, the one greater than Moses who has come. And he hasn't come simply to purify the heart with forgiveness, but he's come to gather our hearts near his own so that we, in a daily, regular life with him, begin to have a heart like his own, in which there is great generosity when we see the poor among us because we don't just see their need, we see Jesus. There is a great morality and fidelity in a spouse with this new heart that realizes my, my thoughts are to be brought before Jesus and made obedient to him. There is a compassion and a goodness and a loveliness and a kindness in such a person whose heart is daily and regularly with Jesus as his very own. There is then an obedience not to the laws but to the one to whom we follow and to whom loves us and we love. It is the Holy Spirit then who's taking all of those 
commandments and decrees and bringing them into reality in our lives. And of course we're not perfect. But we are so much more than forgiven. Our God is with us. Near us. He's for us. Now you think about it. What other religion in the world today? What other religion is there that has their gods so close to them as the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is to us? Name one. So, do not forget these things. Do not let them fade from your heart. Teach them to your children and to their children after them. May the Lord then keep you close to his heart. Amen.